It is the event that opened the eyes of people around the world. I can't breathe here. There's kind of just this collective feeling of being tired of this. And sparked calls for change. This is not a black problem. This is not black people being upset. Black people have a reason and a right to be angry and be upset. Change that goes beyond calls to defund the police and moves toward investment and access to essential services. It's not good to force a black family to go to the neighborhood school if the neighborhood school is not doing right by their kids. A move toward real equality. You lose your life from this virus, and yet we're still going through these moments of acts of blatant act, acts of racism and terror. This is a KCRA3 Project Community Special 2020 Justice for All. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Project Community 2020 Justice for All. Justice and equality, different things, but related and intertwined in the fabric of America's current landscape. Well, the death of George Floyd triggered protests. It spread from Minneapolis all the way to here in Sacramento and beyond. But the deeper conversation about how to get justice and what equality means is one that we hope to at least start tonight. And what we're seeing on the streets today can be traced back over the past decade. On February 26, 2012, this young man, Trayvon Martin, was walking in a gated community in Sanford, Florida. A neighborhood watch member named George Zimmerman claimed Martin was acting strange. It was a fatal encounter for Martin. So here's the first shot, and here's the second shot. Zimmerman claimed at trial that Trayvon Martin slammed his head against the pavement, something the medical examiner disputed. He was acquitted under Florida's Stand Your Ground law, which allows for a self-defense claim if you think your life is in danger. The acquittal of George Zimmerman sparked protest across the country. At the time, 22 states had Stand Your Ground laws. Today, 34 states have them. At the same time, attention to the number of police shootings against African Americans were coming to the forefront. In the wake of the protest, a new organization sprung up. Shut it down! One year after the death of Trayvon Martin, three women calling themselves radical black organizers from Los Angeles, Oakland, and New York created Black Lives Matter. It would not be long before their credo was spoken in the streets again. I'm minding my business. Please just leave me alone. July 2014, police in Staten Island, New York, placed Eric Garner in a chokehold. His final words. Garner's death was ruled a homicide by the medical examiner. His final three words, I can't breathe, became a rallying cry. And protesters took to the streets of Manhattan, bringing the city's traffic to a standstill, confronting police. There was no indictment for the officers choking Garner. While he was fired, the officer is now suing for wrongful termination. Just one month later, August 2014, 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot by a white officer, Darren Wilson, in Ferguson, Missouri. Wilson claimed that Brown, a robbery suspect, threatened and lunged at him after an altercation at his squad car. Michael Brown took six bullets to his body. When a grand jury did not hand up an indictment, the city of Ferguson erupted. Put simply, we all need to hold ourselves to a high standard. For a second time, the Obama White House was addressing national issues of race, all while peaceful protests had turned to anger about the shooting and the police response to protests. Even Missouri's congressional leaders were upset with Ferguson PD. How effective is a show of what is military force in a obviously intensely emotionally charged environment. It is a call that was eventually taken up across the country. It's important to show solidarity. Bottom line, uh, what's happening in Ferguson is disgusting. And it's important for them to see that we stand with you and that we're watching and that all of America is watching. This time, the response was to draw down on the sale of surplus military equipment to police departments, but little talk of community investment or changes in police departments themselves. April 2015, Freddie Gray is arrested and dies in police custody before he arrives at jail. Gray was injured and then never belted safely into the back of the police van. The Freddie Gray situation was just uh, the straw that broke the camel's back for real. So therefore, everybody's angry. This is what's going to happen. What happened was protests, riots, and looting, Baltimore burning in the wake of Gray's funeral. 
This time, six officers are indicted in the death of Gray, but three are acquitted. One officer's case gets a mistrial, and prosecutors drop the remaining charges. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand off it. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir. And his July license. 2016, Philando Castile lies bleeding in a car. His girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds, live streaming the aftermath of the police shooting. Castile eventually dies from his injuries. The officer, Geronimo Yanez, is charged with two felony counts of dangerous discharge of a firearm and second degree manslaughter. Yanez is later found not guilty by a jury. Hey! Show your hands! Stop! Stop! March 2018. This time it's Sacramento. Two police officers investigating reports of broken windows chase Stefan Clark into a backyard. Show me your hands! Get in, get in. Officers say they believed Clark had a gun aimed at them. It turns out it was a cell phone. Justice! I want justice for my baby! I want justice for Stephon Clark! Say his name! Protesters took to the streets of Sacramento, blocking all traffic on Interstate 5, preventing entry to Golden One Center for the Kings game. We're just going to keep being out here, um, rain or shine. Black Lives Matter of Sacramento, now one of 40 local chapters of the organization, began daily protests, holding vigil for months outside the district attorney's office. The hope being the DA would press charges against the two officers who shot Clark. The law requires that we decide or we judge the reasonableness of an officer's actions based upon the circumstances confronting them at that moment of time. We must recognize that they are often forced to make split-second decisions. But after nearly a year of waiting, the officers are not charged, not by the DA and later not by the Attorney General or the FBI. Please leave my I can appreciate it. And this year, outrage against police violence and alleged racism reignited over the killing of George Floyd. Eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's how long Officer Derek Chauvin had his knee on an unarmed, handcuffed George Floyd's neck in Minneapolis. Those eight minutes would reverberate across the globe. As you can probably hear, we're seeing a, a lot of cars driving by, a huge crowd. In the middle of a pandemic, Sacramento protesters joined like-minded around the world saying enough. I want people to remain focused on the fact that the pandemic is just accelerating. The fact that all these issues existed prior to the pandemic. In Minneapolis, protests turned to riots as a police station burned. In Sacramento, protesters took the U.S. flag off the Sacramento police station and put up a Black Lives Matter flag. Looting occurred, storefronts boarded up. From Minneapolis to Sacramento to Washington, London and beyond. My confidence is in the people right now because we are, we're not accepting anything right now. We're going to keep, and the momentum is staying strong. Um, so my confidence is in that and that we'll put pressure until we see what we need to see. Derek Chauvin and two of the officers who stood by when George Floyd was killed are now facing charges themselves. Calls to defund police budgets and give that money to community investment and social programs are gaining momentum. We still want people to be held accountable. We don't want killer cops on our streets, and we will continue to fight for justice. But as attention is drawn to police actions, activists say it goes beyond justice and needs to start moving toward equity in the community. Well, today's call for change continues with Sacramento and counties all over the country beginning the slow process of police reform. KCRA 3's Brandi Cummings held a series of talks to have deeper discussions beyond the protests. She joins us now with the details on what they talked about, Brandi. Well, Lisa Gulson, our first panel explored questions like how did we get here and what does it take to fix what's broken? Here are our first three panelists. Khalil Ferguson is an activist, author and member of the Sacramento Measure U Committee. Elika Bernard is a community organizer and the communications director for Black Justice. And Dr. Stan Odin is an author and political science professor at Sacramento State. What is it that made the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis different from what we've seen? And why do you think it prompted the response that we saw all across the country? What's happening today um, is really what I could call uh, um, uh, um, Freedom Summer 2.0, as well as Black Liberation Movement 2.0. We see white people out, out in the community, out in our, our states protesting way more than happened in 1964 and 68. And then the Black Liberation Movement has evolved to the Black Lives Matter Movement, which has evolved in a different manner through, uh, through the internet. 
And so George Floyd was able to really bring up all those images of Emmett Till and all those other images that, that, that has really inspired black people to fight for the freedom. And so what we see today is a, is a revolutionary change. What made this particular instance that happened in Minneapolis different? And why did it spark the response he, even here in Sacramento and across the world that we saw? So I've never seen the George Floyd video because um, from what I understand, he begged for his life in a way that um, is truly haunting. And he called out for his mother that I think resonated with a lot of women. And a lot of us imagined our own children being in that, um, being in that predicament where they have to beg for their life. And I think the fact that people have been at home for the past five months and have had time to sit and really think about where we are in our country. And I think COVID has really leveled the playing field. With regards to Minneapolis, I feel like Minneapolis itself happened um, because Minneapolis has been tired of the police brutality. We must not forget that Philando Castile was also in Minneapolis. Minneapolis, is, even though it has not been publicized heavily, has also had a very rough relations between police and the community. Um, and this was kind of like that, that, that needle popping the, uh, pop the balloon. Uh, you in particular spearheaded the largest student-led demonstration at Sac, St Sac State. What do you think ultimately motivates younger people to get involved in the movement and to be a part of the marches and the protests that we've seen? The, the younger folks have the energy. Um, and I'm sure Professor Odin can attest to this, being that he was a part of the Black Panther Party in the 60s as well um, and founded the BSU at Davis. Um, the younger, the younger, the youth have the, the voice, they have the energy, but they most importantly have the power. And Huey Newton and a lot of the Black Panthers always reify this um, when they say that the youth always inherit the revolution. And we see that to be true because the youth are the ones who have the energy, who have the knowledge and who study rigorously to ensure that this continues on, to ensure that we have the energy to, 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 press, to press for these movements. Um, as we grow older, we, you know, we have these responsibilities that take us, you know, you know uh, it triggers more into the capitalist state um, we have to pay for our, pay our bills, you know, have to get a job, have to cover all these, all these expenses, these responsibilities associated with being an adult. We kind of lose the focus and we kind of become a little bit less radical with regards to our answers and, and to our, um, and our analyses, um, as we grow older. So the youth always refresh the revolutionary rhetoric and refresh the revolutionary movement and the energy of the revolution, which is why the youth are so important. When the youth learn they have the power, the youth can move mountains. How do you, as a grassroots organizer, and I know working with many other groups, how do you keep the focus on what the goal and the missions are in your community? So for instance, is, is the goal and the mission uh, and, and the reason for the protest the same in Minneapolis as it is here in Sacramento? And how do you keep, keep the focus on what it is that you ultimately seek? I'm really glad you asked that question because it is the million dollar question. Um, we keep the focus. I think every city has its own unique um, problems, its own unique budget, its own unique history with the police, and I think it should be addressed as such. But I think the main focus, um, and this is, I, you know, from what I've been doing and organizing, is to redistribute wealth and power Black into the Black community. And I think that is a conversation that Black organizers have with other black community leaders to make sure that we're all on the same page so that um, we aren't picked apart by our city government, um, so that we aren't played against each other. But that is definitely a conversation that has to be ongoing to keep control of the narrative and to keep people understanding that this is more than just a show of force and murals are important painting the streets are important, but also getting inside the systems that continuously um, oppress black people and dismantling it from the inside out is just as important. So we wanna keep people focused on the fact that the core thing that we're getting is redistributing wealth and political power back into the black community. That is where our goal is, and it's not a negotiable. We have seen statues and symbols of historic oppression coming down across the country. Does that alone signal change related to this movement specifically? No, no, it's not. It's only a part of what has to happen. Um, tearing down some of these racist statues is about the, uh, about the imagery of white supremacy. 
and the imagery of white supremacy has been on the backs of black people and all people of conscious of consciousness over the past hundred years or so. And so some of these some of these very despicable individuals who were traitors, who were uh, um, against uh, the freedom of black people, these statues ought to go down. But that's just only a start. Everything else has to happen institutionally in terms of policies that have to be changed um, inside and out. Um, I'm very admiring of these two young people who are the leaders of today. They're leading me um, because they know the direction. And, and, and yes, I was involved back in the 60s and, and 70s and so forth, and we led them. And, and, but, but now we have some new leaders, and, um, and so we're trying to um, make things happen at the education level, at the higher education level, for example, at Sacramento State. Uh, I was co-founding a, a organization called the Center on Race, Immigration, and Social Justice myself, as well as Dr. Manuel Barajas. We are leading uh, faculty and students in terms of institutional change and anti-racism at Sacramento State. Uh, we've been doing this for the past three or four years. Uh, uh, we see that there's a need to uh, uh, to reshape a, a curriculum and reshape attitudes and, and build consciousness of, of students. So what we had there were a lot of viewpoints being shared, new ways of thinking there. So Brandy, what was one of the more powerful points you heard during your conversations with these people? Well, you know, Golston, my biggest takeaway really was uh, what ultimately triggered the massive protest that we saw. You know, one of the panelists mentioned, as you heard, that this wasn't the first time that there was an incident related to an unarmed black man and police. So Minneapolis really became sort of the epicenter of frustration, not to mention millions of people were at home home all because of the pandemic. So perhaps for some of them, this was an opportunity for the first time in weeks to get out and for many, or it may have been that they were tuned into the news more because of the pandemic or even on their phones. They really became front seat viewers to what happened. So ultimately, Golston, Gulf, Lisa, you know, either way, I think uh, these protests were like nothing that we've seen in recent history. Absolutely. Brandy, thank you. Still ahead, disparities in health care and the fight to close the African-American education achievement gap. First, though, KCRA 3 Stephanie Lynn has been covering the protests since they began. She's met and spoke with the men and the women who families who march for change. I'm Stephanie Lynn in Cesar Chavez Plaza, and this has become a gathering space for supporters and demonstrators with the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, we've spoken with many of them, and throughout this hour, you'll hear some of their stories in their own words. It's like a certain conversation that every young man, like probably had, every young black man has probably had once in their, their life. It's like they tell you, they pull you to the side. If a cop pull you over, you know, you have to be compliant, try to be as respectful as you can, show your hands at all times, don't talk back. You go to a store, you don't touch anything, you can't do that. They'll look at you, you go up into a store, and they'll just look at you, even though you're probably about to buy something. It's like, it just makes you feel uncomfortable. It just makes me feel like, a, like an outcast, kind of, like, like I'm not normal. And that was a surreal situation because it really could have went right or left. In the instant that I was grabbing my phone out of my middle console, I could have got shot. And that's the scary part is people don't understand the fear that they're instilling into people. And we're supposed to respect our, our officers. We're supposed to see them as figures or pillars of the community. We should not see them as a threat or someone that we're scared of, that kids are hiding behind cars to stay away from the police, not to be in the police's eye. Families don't want to call 911 um, for domestic abuse cases because they don't know that the cops pull up that they're either going to arrest the right person or they're going to shoot them or cause any violence to them. The uh, police officers, I even see putting a black fist up, all these Black Lives Matter signs, these things don't do anything for us. I don't celebrate in any of that because still when you look at the lack of equity, the lack of investment, and the responsibility that I feel America has to, that created this problem. This is not a black problem. This is not black people being upset. 
black people have a reason and a right to be angry and be upset. We don't want to be out here fighting and screaming, saying our lives matter, saying we deserve this. Don't um, hunt us down. Don't shoot us down. Why do we continually to uh, be attacked by Karens when they feel threatened and quit to call the police and the police calm down and harass us? That's not our problem. That's a, a white America problem. That's not a black America problem. Well, with America's eyes open to economic disparities, there is a swift change to bring health care, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, to underserved communities. Today, dozens of Oak Park residents visited St. Paul's Missionary Baptist Church to be tested for COVID-19. It's one of six new community-based testing sites. Case Area 3's Vicki Gonzalez shows us why experts say it's a start, but there's so much more that needs to be done. Kevin Carter is making health a priority. Good morning so he can stay strong for his community. I'm 60 years old, you know what I'm saying? I have atrial fibrillation. I'm a little bit overweight, so I have to pay attention. The co-founder of the Poor People's Campaign in Sacramento is advocating for COVID-19 prevention in communities most at risk. It's important, you know, for the black and brown community to make sure that we have health care. Pushing for the testing clinic in his Oak Park neighborhood. Everything is out of Cal Expo, but people cannot make it to Cal Expo, and we need something in the, in the community. Dr. Jan Murray Garcia, UC Davis School of Nursing, has been devoting her career to closing generations of public health inequities. That script was written 80 or 90 years ago. Explaining the lack of access to health care traces back to racial redlining. South Oak Park, Meadowview, and then Del Paso Heights Highland area. Those are areas where there are a lot of Latinos and African Americans and um, high concentrations of poverty. Communities at higher risk of contracting the virus. Blacks and Latinos tend to be at the bottom in the service areas. So lowest wages, um, less flexibility, less time off for illness if they have any of that. Ironically, that's not where the testing was concentrated initially. That's changed in the last couple of weeks, but it, it was not those neighborhoods. The UC Davis Center for Reducing Health Disparities explains these gaps translates to Latino and black communities meeting COVID-19 with underlying health conditions. They have uh, uh, chronic diseases at a higher uh, rates than the rest of the population. 
Diabetes is a case, obesity, uh, hypertension. Go to the registrar and she'll get you fixed. Oh, thank you. Which is why advocates like Kevin get tested not only for themselves, but for their community. We had opportunity to bring the awareness and wake people up, you know, to let them know that this is not something that's just going to go away. You need to pay attention. In Sacramento, Vicki Gonzalez, KCORA 3 News. Closing the gap on access and availability to affordable health care and preventative medicine will not only help individual communities, it's necessary for the overall health of the country. Okay, Sierra 3's Brandy Cummings joins us right now again with a closer look at the health care landscape for people of color. Brandy. Yeah, we continue our look at the effects of health and social inequalities with a conversation to shed the light on health disparities and explore solutions. Shannon Shaw is the executive director of Her Health First. Alondra Thompson is the Behavioral Health Director of One Community Health. Dr. Jonathan Porteous is the CEO of Wellspace Health, and Terry Moore is the Director of Adult Services at the Center for Fathers and Families. We'll begin with this question. Where do you all think the greatest disparities appear in the African American community as it relates to health? Um, we see disproportionate rates of, um, of chronic conditions. We see disproportionate uh, rates of um, behavioral health conditions. We see um, disproportionate rates of um, uh, perinatal concerns like um, prematurity and low birth weight. Um, and these typically have very little to do with the people who are um, experiencing these conditions and much more to do with the context in which they're living and the ecosystem that, that basically creates the inequity. Where do you think the greatest disparities exist? You know, I, I think that, you know, racism in healthcare like manifests in many structural forms. And in, this includes like concentrations of, you know, people of color in communities that lack quality healthcare facilities. Um, there's harsh environmental factors in predominantly black communities, inequality in workplace, um, highly concentrated food insecurity within different communities of color. Is it just African-Americans that are facing these challenges? I mean, when you talk about the access to healthcare, uh, you know, why is it different? For, for, for instance, you know, a poor single mother of one race to get health care or maybe even have better access than it is for a poor single African American mother. There is a lot of historical trauma that is to back that, Brandy. You know, we have had experiments after experiments done on our bodies where that trust. It is just an issue much different than other cultures that we have had to witness and and it's scary, honestly. Because Terry, you have your own experiences uh, dealing with some challenges related to healthcare. So I want you to share just a part of your story uh, and talk a little bit about your work now. Um, I kind of feel like uh, where the need is the greatest, the attention is the least. Uh, it's a matter of access to the care. And then with our fathers and even myself, it's a matter of uh, information, right? So in a lot of these areas, you know, there's um, uh, the marketing is greater for uh, liquor stores and the marketing is greater. I mean, we all know where Walmarts are. So I'm wondering how do we hear the information about uh, healthcare and who's reaching out? And then when you have your lower income, they're going to be served a lesser quality of healthcare. And then we hear that back to us and then we don't trust it. I went a period without health care, without anyone to um, reach out to me, without any um, resources and just searching, not knowing which one was the best. Our fathers didn't know which one was the best. We kind of all went in different directions. I ended up being fortunate because of my previous military background. So I was able to get medical care. But we have a lot of fathers who have families that, that don't know where to go, that are not being marketed this, or their income is not at the level it needs to be. And they end up suffering with children and their children don't get the care. And some of them even lose custody because they cannot provide medical care. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of my story real short. And then also covering some of the fathers that I know could not afford the packages that were offered to them, especially at uh, later ages in their life. 
how much does the type of insurance, the color of your skin, and where you live impact the type of health care you get? We hear that it's uh, it does have a huge impact. We've we've had to bring healthcare to communities that are preponderantly communities of color because it's kind of just not existed there. We provide healthcare to the low income population, and so um, what what we see is that historically there's not even been kind of a penetration or a providing of those services in the communities of origin. You have to literally travel to get to healthcare. Obviously, we know the further you need to travel for anything, the less likely you are to go there. Um, I wanted to touch on the access piece too, because it's not just necessarily like the proximity or where facilities are located, but th there's this misconception that families, and specifically like black families, can just drop everything, take time off work, find childcare, and show up to their appointments. Like that's not realistic. And you know, our services through Black Mothers United, now we're supplemental services on top of medical care. But you have to think about from the perspective of a pregnant woman who may have other children in the home, maybe not. Maybe she's just pregnant. Like adding one more thing on top of her job, her you know, general OBGYN appointments, it just becomes one more thing. And then we're adding additional stress. So you think it's so critical as providers that we are meeting the families where they are and also asking black communities what do you need from your provider instead of dictating it, like Jonathan was saying? Well, you know, I have to be a person who has a pretty good income, a good position, and I still had the disparity of losing a baby at 26 and a half weeks due to not knowing, you know, and not being informed. My body had hormones being produced from stressors outside of my day to day, just being a black woman. And when you're aware of that and your provider can support you and what you need to deal with and how you can deal with those stressors, it could help. I mean, I think that's what brought me into health field because I myself have the story of having a lot of disparities throughout my first pregnancy. And to experience that demise got me to wanting to know more about the why, because I'm educated, I have good income. It's not about the proximity or the low income. We have to bring in the truth about the institutionalized racism that a black mother deals with on day to day as being black. There's a gap there that brings a lack of confidence, let's say for a black mother or a black person in general, because the perception is that your insurance plan or policy or who you are um, fronts you when you get to the receptionist desk. And with that being said, um, where there's a seem to be, where do we gain confidence knowing that when we're approaching a situation with our health, that because of the color of our skin or because of our insurance plan, the lack thereof, mm -hmm. that we will not receive the greatest of care, the l lesser of quality, and probably the lesser of uh, customer service because of those factors. So there doesn't seem like a lot of confidence in going to healthcare because you're automatically starting off uh, behind. Also, we, uh, as those, I'm going to say I, let's say I, because I'm a man of, of, of it's white, we need to work on our implicit biases. It's, it's not just, you know, what we think about how we deliver care. It's what's underneath our thoughts. What are the things that are automatic and involuntary in the way we think? How have we been programmed and raised in our culture? And there's plenty of opportunities to do training. There are implicit um, association tests that we can take to understand just our automatic associations that come. I don't want to think of myself as a person who's racist, but I have to address the fact that I have been raised in a very generic mainstream culture that and I have, may have just swallowed concepts completely whole without even realizing it. Being okay to not be okay with who you are and expressing it in a safe space and learning and being able to have that ally, you know, with your staff and your members is huge. It's huge. And it decreases a lot of that stressors for the member that's coming into that room knowing that there is some trauma-informed care training, understanding, education, and themselves in front of each other. We're mirrors to our population. And without that acceptance and acknowledgement, we can never be trusted the way we deserve to be trusted in order to serve the population that we want to continue to be a part of their well-being. 
So you heard a lot of different viewpoints there, but it's pretty rare that a CEO would admit some of the things that Dr. Porteous admitted. He was very candid and I appreciate his honesty. Everyone can agree though, this conversation really is just the start. So Lisa Golson, it really is up to people in positions of power to ultimately change a lot of these disparities. All right, Brandy, thanks. It was really enlightening there. Well, as you just heard, from health to safety, it requires a matter of trust. And right now, when it comes to the African-American community, there is less of that trust and plenty of fear and frustration. Here now, in their own words, what it's like to live black in America. I think the black man is, we're scared of the black man. We're afraid of him. I think we're, we don't, we don't expect much out of him. I think the black man has been um, looked down upon, been frowned upon. The black man has been, um, have been oppressed for so long that they have become accustomed to being oppressed. They have become used to being in the struggle, used to survival. How do you become accustomed to survival? I talked a little bit about um, my privilege having light skin, but part of that is um, I think I've internalized some of the things white people might, have, might feel right now, like guilt, like shame. I think I've also internalized those things even though I'm not white. And it's kind of just shows that it shows that it's a wound that crosses barriers in this country. Like we don't, you don't have to be white to feel that. I think where we are at is that this at that we're saying enough is enough. I think we have to uh, come to terms both that the fact that Trump administration has kind of opened that wound up even more, uh, but now it's up to us to really um, come together and say collectively that this systemic racism that it was from my childhood, my parents' childhood, their parents' parents' childhood. We have to come to terms with that and really uh, decide that we are going to move forward, but move forward together and untangle the uh, just web of how deep this runs from systems of government to police brutality to lack of a safety net and economic relief.
Welcome back to Project Community 2020 Justice for All. Beyond, beyond justice and equality, a major gap exists in education. And yeah, graduation rates are a big part of that. The highest graduation rate is in the Asian community at 93%. 89% of white students in California graduated high school last year. 83% of Hispanics graduated. By comparison, 78% of African Americans graduated. There are a number of reasons for that gap in graduations and attendance, and kids with special needs tend to face even tougher challenges for parents like Leah Schenk. One of her four children is on the autism spectrum and faces bigger challenges. Challenges she says are even harder as an African American. I have to question every single thing that comes my way. You know, everything that they give me as far as services, I have to question them. I have to find out and do my research to see, like, are they really helping me? Are they really doing everything I need them to do for my child? Or is there more that they can do that they're just not telling me about? Shang says online learning due to the pandemic has made it even harder as the kids have to adjust to learning at home. And there are those trying to overcome those obstacles. KCRA 3's Emily Maha shows us one approach to closing the African-American achievement gap. A part of setting a college going culture is to constantly surround the kids with a message that, you know, that is around about college. Pennants from colleges across the country line the halls of William Lee College Prep, a fortune school in Sacramento. Fortune School is a regional initiative to close the African American achievement gap by preparing kids for college starting in kindergarten. President and CEO of Fortune School, Dr. Margaret Fortune, operates each of the system's eight tuition free college prep public charter schools under five pillars choice, commitment, more time, focus on results, and citizenship. Our expectation is that kids are going to be competitively eligible for college, and because of that, they're going to get their dream job. According to the California Department of Education, nearly 70% of African American students are not proficient in English language arts. Only one in five are proficient in math. African American students, not just in Sacramento, but statewide, are the lowest performing subgroup other than students with special needs. At Fortune School, which is majority African American, students spend more time in the classroom compared to their peers in other schools. The school day and year are both longer. If kids are in school longer, that means adults are in school longer. So you can't have teachers contracts that limit the amount of time that teachers spend teaching kids in school. That's a problem. Accomplishments and areas of room for improvement are widely acknowledged. Data sheets hang outside classroom doors. Schools have to be honest places about that, especially when the school system systematically underserves black children. She says students in Fortune School are closing the academic achievement gap. 66% of students at, at Fortune School, which is a majority African American school, are proficient in math and English language arts. Because Fortune School is a system of charter schools, parents make a choice to send their child here. It's an option Dr. Fortune says is critical to black families underserved by their neighborhood schools. It's not good to force a black family to go to the neighborhood school if the neighborhood school is not doing right by their kids. In California, public schools can look different neighborhood to neighborhood. Even with uh, there being um, a clear funding formula for school districts and therefore for schools. Each individual school still has the capacity of its community to raise additional funds. Sac State professor Pia Wong says that's part of the reason some public schools have more money and amenities than others. Some schools still have the ability to go and say to the parents, um, hey, you know, we got our budget and we can't afford a music teacher. Can we do a fundraiser? And they can and then they raise those funds. And other school communities don't, don't have that. The way California funds its public schools has changed over the years. School districts used to be funded by local property taxes set by local officials. Schools in wealthier neighborhoods got more money because property values were higher. But that changed in 1978 with Prop 13, which put a cap on property taxes. Property owners needing some property tax relief, and they weren't really thinking about school funding. Prop 13 limited the power local officials had to generate money through property taxes, leading to less funding available for school districts. Until we sort of recapture this idea that, that we want um, high quality health care and housing and public schooling for every resident in California, um, we're going to keep sort of um, 
we're going to stay in this wheel of, of inequity. Wong says some parents have moved away from the public school system, instead sending their kids to private schools and becoming less likely to support tax initiatives to fund public districts. If you don't have your kids in that system, then you're not going to want to pay taxes. Um, for kids in that system. In 2013, under the leadership of Governor Jerry Brown, the state enacted a new way to fund public schools, the local control funding formula, an effort to get more money to students who need it most. It's very hard to actually address a problem if you don't name it. So I think that the local control funding formula says we have a, a problem with um, inequitable funding. And um, here is our here is our way to, to fix it. The state provides a base level dollar amount per student in the district. Under the new formula, districts serving students with high needs, like English learners, low income kids, and foster youth, get additional funding. And if you have a certain concentration of students in those groups, you get more money per student, and that's how it works. Emily Maha, KCRA Three News. The disparities in education can be seen on California campuses, the haves and the haves nots, but inequity goes beyond just money and resources. KCRA 3's Brandy Cummings joins us with a closer look at education and equity. Brandy? Yeah, from a conversation about the school to prison pipeline to a conversation about removing police from schools and even affirmative action, we talked about all of it. We want to introduce you now to our next group of panelists. Meet Dr. Andrea Moore. She's an ethnic studies professor at California State University, Sacramento. Kim Williams is the director of Building Healthy Communities. She's also a member of the Sacramento City Unified School District's African American Achievement Task Force. Dr. Ati Mosupie is the African Studies Program Director at CSUS. And Daryl White chairs the Black Parallel School Board. So we will direct this first question to Daryl and Kim. It's well known that wealthier property tax districts have better resources and teachers. What would it take to bring some of that money into poorer school districts and ultimately level the playing field? Daryl, we'll start with you. Even in districts with schools that are funded similarly, communities always find ways to devote more resources to one school or the other. Uh, we thought we were going to get it done with LCAP and uh, uh, with the supplemental funding. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it became gimmicky in the sense that those monies didn't go to the students it was designed for and pulled at the end of the school year. And then districts then could go in and take that money and use it for whatever they want to use it for. So I think the first thing that has to happen is we've got to correct our LCAP process where those supplemental monies actually go to the students that they're designed to go to and that there be policies that make it very clear that those money, not only how those monies are going to be used for, but there's a tracking system that uh, makes sure that they're used for those reasons. To that point, uh, you know, talking about those decisions and some decisions that are being made, we're seeing a lot of school districts pull police out of the schools or those SRO as they're often called. What impact do you think that's going to have on black students? Well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer of having uh, not having SROs in schools. I think, don't get me wrong, I do know, understand that there are some schools that have some challenges and that, that need supports, but I think um, that there's other ways to uh, manage discipline in schools and even, even, you know, crimes that may happen on school campuses versus having police. I think the, the message of having police on campus sends um, the wrong message to a lot of, especially our African-American students who are already traumatized by policing in their communities and then they now have to go and see them at school. So what is the message that we're sending to our students? Like they can't feel safe anywhere. Um, and I know, you know, I get the arguments that, you know, they're, you know, trying to bridge the gap and those are wonderful. And we need to bridge the gap between communities and policing and we need to, all those things need to happen. But school is a place where kids are supposed to feel safe. They need to be where they can learn and they need to feel that, um, and feel supported. In California, 78% of African-American students graduate from high school. By comparison, 89% of white students graduate. Why does that gap exist and what needs to be done to close it? Because we know uh, you are in higher education, but of course, if students don't graduate high school, they never make it to college. So they would never even sit in one of your classes. Thank you for that question. There are a multitude of reasons to explain that gap. Um, one of them could be schools that have zero to tolerance policies. So policies that are put in place that create different um, 
levels of punishment, if you will, that will place the African-American child or the child who is receiving the consequence in a situation where they cannot attend school. So if they are being suspended, they are missing school, they're missing assignments, they're missing the education. And that then plays a toll on them missing work, falling behind in their education opportunities. In addition to that, it could also be the way in which the curricula is being taught. What do you think needs to be done to ultimately close that gap and, and, and uh, help African-American students graduate on a higher level and then ultimately, again, pursue higher education? The prison, the school prison pipeline, which is caused by the uh, discipline divide, the way the um, um, the way the schools punish the uh, disproportionately punish African American students, and as a result, deprive them of exposure to. Uh, the knowledge that goes on every day. And then, so their performance cannot be blamed on lack of intelligence, lack of hard work, lack of diligence. This how the structure ha happens. So the zero tolerance, the zero tolerance and the way the discipline divide it has to change. That has to be. That has to change. Uh, how do you think ACA five, which is the uh, affirmation of affirmative action that would ultimately require colleges and universities not to discriminate based on race, color, sex, or religion? How do you think that would impact African American students? Dr. Moore, please give us your thoughts on this. So the way I was introduced to affirmative action was um, some people taught me that it was giving us crumbs at the table. And some folks have explained it that if it is not written in policy, it will not be upheld through application processes. And that if it's not written, um, then we may not see our students being accepted into college. And I think the best way to answer what have I seen and what have I experienced, for example, since we no longer have affirmative action is I have seen a tremendous decrease in black college students graduating. Um, for example, I went to UC Davis and at UC Davis along the wall, they would take a photograph of every black graduating class. And after that law changed, what we began to see is our numbers shrink tremendously. What are the specific strategies that you think will best help African-American students? First of all, I like the idea of ethnic studies as a anchor for what I call culturally responsive instruction. I think our teachers have to have a better uh, idea of who our students are so that they can serve their needs. Uh, I still, as a clinical um, a practitioner at a national university with student teachers, we still have an issue with teachers having the confidence, having uh, to be able to make a parent phone call if it's a kid of color. So the real challenge, as so many of our panelists uh, talk to, is how do you change centuries-old behavior? How do you fix a broken system made to work against certain communities? Well, the reality is that change, well, it really does start in each one of us. You know, it's easy to sit back sometimes and wait on someone else to make a difference, but everyone can do something. And so, Golston, Lisa, we ask our viewers tonight, and we want to leave everyone with this question and this thought, what will that something ultimately be for you? Well, there's so much. I mean, both little and small and uh, little and big, and they can both make a difference Absolutely. for sure. All right, thanks. And as we just heard, these impacts on the education system play a large role in the experiences of kids as they grow up. More with uh, in their own words in what it's like to grow up black in America. I'm just talking to a friend about um, an exercise that happens in a lot of schools where, you know, the teacher will assign the kids to do a lesson about the country that their ancestors came from. And a lot of black people in this country can't do that. Um, you can't identify a country because we were stolen, you know, so long ago. And I did the mail-in DNA test and found out that my black ancestors have been on American soil uh, in the South since the 1600s. My, my ancestry is like rooted in the American South. That's where essentially I come from. And so this idea that we're somehow separate, like black Americans are here and Americans are here is 
so deeply um, wrong. Me growing up in Sacramento, it was hard because I had a lot of white friends because I was an intelligent person. You know, I had good grades, I was reading books, I was you kind of just really into school and the Caucasians, white America was kind of okay with that. And then I was kind of bullied and teased for being smart from, you know, the black community. So it kind of was always a, a, a balance, but then I would have black friends and I would have um, white students that kind of would um, kind of attract themselves to me, if that makes sense. And then we would have the ones that, you know, they didn't necessarily like me. George Floyd's death should bring policy and legislative change. If we're not focusing on policy and legislative change and recommendations on how to prevent these types of things from happening again, then they died just to be a hashtag. And I, I would not allow that for Stefan. I will not allow that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for KCRA 3's Project Community 2020 Justice for All. KCRA 3 is dedicated to advancing the conversations on racial disparities and looking for solutions throughout the year. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.